My goal for you, you guys are going to get stuck with me for the next two talks. So we're just going to slide from one into the next. We're going to talk about cervical spine injuries. And then we're going to talk a little bit about thoracic trauma. And then we're going to have a little bit break in a little bit, okay? All right, so let's get into cervical spine injuries. This is one that will come up every single day of your life. Who do I put into a C-collar? Who do I get an x-ray on? Who should get that CAT scan? I don't want a CAT scan every kid's neck. There's going to be a few real key slides here that I'm going to point out that I think you could circle. In fact, some of the components of some of these slides I have built into macros, into my EMR, to help with my medical decision making specifically about why I did not do a CT scan on a kid's neck or why I thought the kid was high risk, and so I'd urge you to um, highlight these things. Okay, how are kids' C-spines different than adults? Kids are built different than adults. The way I like to explain this is kids' heads and bodies are big bowling balls sitting on top of toothpicks, right? That's how they look. When you look at them walking around, they have these massive heads with these little, little, little tiny toothpick that's supposed to support it. And then when you look at them, they got these big bellies. And that's what leads to most of their injuries. In general, kids' cervical spine injuries tend to be higher. That's what you need to remember. Above C4 is where these injuries happen. Kids do all sorts of crazy things, but still by far the most common time you're going to see neck injuries is motor vehicle accidents, but also things like diving into swimming pools or any type of axial loading, gymnastics, things like that. So you know that they're going to be a little bit higher. You know that their muscles are weak, right? So their muscles are weak. they got this tiny little neck. Everything sits a little bit flatter. And because of that really, really large head, the fulcrum tends to be right at around C1, C2, C3. So when they do have cervical spine injuries, their injuries are high, and that can lead to some devastating injuries. But overall, injuries are rare. Look at this picture of how we look. This is the weirdest picture ever, right? But this is... This is giant baby syndrome. But this kid's head, look at this, proportionally to their body is huge relative to an adult, right? And this is also why kids get more blunt abdominal injuries too if you look at their torso. Okay, so we talked about higher injuries, but in general, even though most of the injuries are high, cervical spine injuries are actually relatively rare, okay? As they get older, though, and the magic number is eight. When you talk about cervical spine injuries in kids, if you could circle one thing on this slide, it's eight years old. Because at eight years old, the actual anatomy changes as well as the x-ray findings where we focus start to change a little bit too, and we're gonna have a little bit of time. There are exceptions to every rule. Here's a little kid who had a lower cervical spine injury where you see this subluxation. So just, you have to be diligent and you have to be complete in your exam. Okay, so the biggest thing is, most of us who see adults have clinical decision tools which really guide everything we do, right? We have Nexus, we have the Canadian C-spine rule, and we use those every day to say, this, ki this person does not need an extra or not. But the problem in kids is that everyone who's ever looked at this Nexus, who only looked at a few kids, C Canadian C-spine rule, which excluded kids completely, and even PCARN, when they try to look at it, the biggest problem is, is there's not that many cervical spine injuries in general that happen. So to develop the perfect decision rule is not the goal. The goal is for you as a provider to understand what is high risk and do not ignore high risk. Understand when you need to jump straight to CT, and when the majority time you just need plain films, and then who you can clear completely clinically, and use your clinical guidance on top of what the evidence is to then make the best decision. So this is one slide to remember. Overall, in every study that's ever been done on kid cervical spine injury, these six things right here have always been identified retrospectively as being considered to be high risk for a kid cervical spine injury. They're very self-evident, um, but I think some of the ones that are tough, right, are midline tenderness and severe torticollis, right? So not, not every single kid here is going to get a CAT scan, right? But the kid who has a neck injury and altered mental status, scan that kid's neck. Okay, that is the highest of the highest risk. And we're going to talk a little bit about which of these you start with the regular cross table lateral of the neck. Okay, but what should make you feel good? I document on my exam, when a kid comes from a swimming pool injury or motor vehicle accident, that they had the absence of all the findings in the slide before. And I actually add a couple more that we're going to talk about. And then I palpate the back of their neck. After I've calmed them down and brought in the bubbles 
and brought in the lights and, and brought in the bluey in the iPad, right? Because you want an environment where they feel safe and calm. And then I palpate the back of the neck and then slowly clear them from their cervical collar. Again, your physician gestalt based on the mechanism and understanding that those risk factors aren't present is powerful. Why do we even care? Like, who cares? Just take a picture on all of them. Then I have it up there. So much better. I don't have to worry about it. Well, yes, you do want to avoid misses, but you're also trying to avoid radiation. And these injuries are rare. Nothing will freak you out more than hearing from one of your colleagues about the kid that got missed on the cervical spine injury and then making you feel more cautious. But if you use these evidence-based tools, then again, I build these into macros, it will mitigate your medical legal risk. And I think overall improve your efficiency. As many of us know, many kids get put in cervical collars when they get brought in that may or may not need them. So which are the ones you're going to keep for the next hour as you try to clear them with x-rays and re-examining? Which can you kind of clear in the first 10 minutes? right? That's the whole point. There's three big ones that are in your slide deck, right? There's the Beaumont C-spine rule, there's the Canadian rule, and there's the Nexus rule. I'm going to kind of fly through these a little bit. You cannot see this on this slide, but I want you guys later on to focus on two boxes. I want you to focus on this box right, this box right here from the Beaumont, Children's, Beaumont Hospital, and if there's a lack of any of these findings at all, you can begin to start to clinically clear them. Okay, if you have abnormal neurological findings, you should be jumping to CT. I want you to really focus on these first three boxes. These first three boxes are the first things you do when EMS brings you in a kid, and you can quickly decide, oh, I'm gonna clear this kid quick, or I'm gonna have to go down the imaging route. We try to reduce imaging because radiation to the neck, of course, can increase the risk of thyroid cancer. And although plain films increase the risk, it's far, far less. In plain films, <coughs> Okay, so the easy kids are the easy kids, but those kids who are kind of in between, do I need to scan them all? Plain films are wonderful for picking up many of the big injuries, and we're gonna talk about that. Nexus and Canadian C-spine rule I've already mentioned, and these are the ones that we've been studying. Until. So just a quick blurb about both of them. In the original Nexus study, there were not that many young kids. There's only 900 young kids, less than eight, and they only had four actual big injuries. So the rule was not powered to pick up every pediatric cervical spine injury. In the Canadian rule, they just said, we're not even going to look at kids, right? But what happens is we kind of apply these rules to kids every day, and then people start getting confused. Well, maybe I'll just clear every single kid. And that's not what I want you to take home from this. Here's a graphic that shows a summary of Nexus and C-spine rule that you can look at a little bit later. But I would, I would caution you that the sensitivity, because there weren't enough kids of those two rules is not powered to detect every pediatric cervical spine injury. So again, back to the point of this talk, which is have your high risk factors in place, go back, look at that Beaumont C-spine algorithm, and incorporate that along with your clinical assessment, and that is how you clear kids C-spine. Again, when your sensitivity isn't close enough to 95, 98%, with a low prevalence disease like pediatric cervical spine injuries, you're going to be missing 10 to 20% of these kids. All right, so this is not adequate, not power to take care of kids. Prashant Mahajan and Julie Leonard um, then had looked at this now through PCARN and said, okay, let's take all the stuff we know that's high risk, and then let's take the PCARN database and look back at how many cervical spine injuries. And look, look at this list. It's almost the same list I showed at the beginning of the talk. And they said these eight factors, remember the first ones were six, these eight factors were all considered high risk with cervical spine injuries. So if you have these eight, yes, you have to pause and you have to figure out how am I gonna clear this kid. But if you don't have these eight, you really can say this kid's probably low risk, calm them down and start clearing their C-spine. But even in PCARM, the sensitivity wasn't high enough. And so it's not enough to say just with the PCARM rule alone, we can kind of just set it and forget it and not use our, our kind of clinical guidance. So this is a good summary of all those things. I would, I would tell you on this slide to focus on the far right, understand what those eight bullet points are, and it summarizes the sensitivity, which is still closer to 90%. And this is a graphic of actually some of the data. Okay, so now you know three rules. You know it's a rare occurrence, but you don't want to miss it. And so you know this is not going to be the bottom line. So how do I incorporate all of these things? Any child with neurological changes, 
a major, major mechanism of injury and severe bony tenderness, you know those kids are getting imaged. Okay, so pull out of those risk factors these three big ones. You're going to image all of these kids. Which kid gets a scan? Which kid gets plain x-rays is now then your next question. Again, any of these things are present, you could probably clinically clear them. But most of us, once you have those high-risk conditions, are saying, do I need CT? Do I need x-ray? Do I need MRI? This is a great summary, I think, at the bottom here. We'll say if you have neurodeficits and you have a very, very high index of suspicion, for example, the kid who jumped into a swimming pool that had no water, it happens still, right? That kid, even if their C-spine plain x-ray is normal, I'm probably not going to clear them. I'm probably going to need imaging. If you have MRI, it's great. Most of us have CT scan as our preferred mechanism. So just think about those high, high risk mechanisms as well as neurodeficits. Here you can see three pictures of kind of the same thing. So on CAT scan, you get really, really good bony imaging. You can see pseudo subluxation. And on x-rays, though, you can actually see it too. MRI, you get more of the enhancements of the cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which may be important to neurology or neurosurgery down the road. Okay? But you don't need an urgent MRI to clear these kids. Again, here you can see compression fractures that are noted on a CT scan versus MRI. Okay. In the last few minutes, those C-spine plane films is the most important things you can do. And I would say this last bullet is the most important. Competent interpretation is the key, so you feel comfortable after that kid who has severe torticollis and is kind of in between with their mechanism and you want to clear them. This is the most important slide for imaging. So the perfect lateral film in pediatrics will pick up 85 to 90% of all cervical spine injuries. And what should you see? You should see four lines that are all in alignment, anterior vertebral body line, posterior vertebral body line, anterior spinal alignment line, and posterior spinous process line. They all make this nice curve, okay? And then you want to focus on this space right here in front of C1 and C2. In front of C2, it should never be more than 7 millimeters, and once you get down to C6, it should never be more than 14 millimeters. Okay, so you got your lines, and then you got your space up front, and then you're going to look at the pre-dental space right in front behind the posterior arc, the anterior arch of C1. That space right there should be no bigger than 5 millimeters. This line, the Swiss chuck, if you've never actually used it, you will need it to delineate if a kid has what's called pseudo-subluxation. You draw a line between the posterior spinous process of C1 and C3, right there to right there. And you see how C2 just kind of naturally sits on that line? If it does not naturally sit on that line and it's off, then it's actually a real subluxation. So take a couple minutes and review kind of how to review a cervical spine film if you haven't. If you do that alone, you will pick up these injuries. And these are the injuries that we worry about in kids, right? You can get real subluxation. You can actually get real subluxation of C2 on C3 where the line doesn't fit. You can actually get odontoid fractures, which is right there at the top of C2, okay? You can get subluxation farther down. Again, injuries above C4, C5 is where we see things. You can, in the worst cases, get things like a hangman's fracture. You can get, again, look at how many of these fractures are around the C1, C2 area. This is what you're doing a plain cervical spine film for, a plain x-ray for, is that you are going to pick up these injuries. You don't need to run to go scan them. And again, if they're normal, you can probably tend to clear them. When a C-spine injury is found, make sure you stop. If you see a finding on the x-ray and you said, oh, I didn't think this kid had anything else going on in their body. If you have enough force to break your neck as a kid, the, the risk of having concomitant blunt abdominal injury and chest wall injury is so high, you should now go back and say, have I missed those injuries? And make sure that you go back and make sure you're doing proper imaging for that. The good news, again, is that in general, your low risk patients are low risk. Your high risk should get a CT, and then everyone else in the middle should get a plain film. Be competent at interpreting those plain films. Give them some ibuprofen if the plain film is normal. Get the kids to calm down. And if the plain film is normal and they're not in one of those high-risk categories, you really can discharge them home. This algorithm, which you can't really read, really summarizes it all nicely together. It lists all the bullets about when to consider a CT on the right as well as some of the high risk factors on the boxes on the right. I thank you for your time.